Welcome. Thank you. Well, I, I, you live here. <laughs> yes, welcome to Thank you. you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It's a, uh, it's a joy to be here and have you on the show. Thanks so much for doing this. Thanks. I mean, you're associated with Portland, Oregon, but you're actually from Washington State. Yes. Do you have a distinct impression of Portland when you were growing up? No, I didn't even know it existed. <laughs> But in, uh, in, to be honest, in the, uh, I mean, Portland was a pretty small town when, uh, and I was in the suburbs of Seattle. And Portland was, the first time I was aware of Portland was through Gus Van Sant films, which are not necessarily, um, so I just thought of it as druggy and, um, and a lot of prostitution. Right, a very affirmative view of. Yeah, so yeah. I, I was like, I have to move there. <laughs> Well, what did precipitate you moving here? Uh, I moved here because the two people I was playing music with in Slater Kinney lived here, and I was spending a lot of time commuting between Olympia, Washington, where I had gone to college, and here. And um, I was tired of commuting, so I moved here. You know, it's it, getting, I've had the same, ex I, I feel like you, you can viscerally feel places when you arrive somewhere, you sort of go, I like this place, or, or not. And, um, Portland is such an agreeable place, such a beautiful place, first of all. You land here, and I've had this feeling when I've come here before, just this kind of wonderful, organic feeling place. When did you realize that this was fodder for, for, for comedy and, and uh, uh, enough comedic culture of fodder here to inspire a TV series? Well, Portland is a city that seems like it was designed by like an eight-year-old. Like, <laughs> if you imagine like asking a kid, like, what do you want for your city? And they would be like, well, you know, I want my house to be painted blue <laughs> with a yellow trim, and all the buildings will look like Legos. <laughs> and people will wait in line to vote no for ice cream. <laughs> and we'll, y you know what? We'll never have to dress up. I'll never have to put on a suit. <laughs> and all the adults will play bass guitar. <laughs> and I'll have a donut shop. What will the donuts be shaped like? Like penises. <laughs> so that's when I thought, well, maybe other people can relate to wanting to live in a city like that. And... Donut! <laughs> and... <laughs> well, you... <laughs> but you sort of... You're also taking the piss, or you're, you're making fun of... Um, what we might call, you know, in sort of creature, hipster culture. Like, who or what do you see yourselves satirizing? Well, I, I don't think a lot of the characters on the show are hipsters at all. I mean, it's, um, it's people that are like my parents and slowly more and more like myself, you know, just... Um, <laughs> you know, like, we're, it's people that are wearing Tiva sandals and thrusting a <laughs> ponytail through the back of a cap. And um, I think it's more about people in conflict with their environment, which is how I feel all the time. You know, I'm, I'm well-meaning, and I go out into the world and out into my day here, and there's things that I love about Portland, and then there's things that I'm so flummoxed by because there's so many rules everywhere. And um, Like what? Well, <laughs> um, well, I have a, a couple examples. Um, I mean, one was just being in, in Whole Foods and... There was this guy in front of me that was complaining because they had a homemade pasta, and the homemade pasta was made in Seattle, <laughs> and <laughs> and so it wasn't local enough. <laughs> and I was like, "Listen, if I could procure pasta from my ass right now, <laughs> I would give it to you. I am so sorry." Hyper local, yeah. <laughs> And, and I also just, I thought, you're shopping at Whole Foods. That's not local either. Like that, so the rules... <laughs> like, um, so, so the rules are very confusing. You know, it's like we're trying to do so well, and, sh and, and, and it's very hard. And so I think the show is just satire, uh, satirizing well-intentioned you know, well people, and that includes myself. And I don't, I don't think of the, the characters on our show as targets because I very much embody many of those people. Well, you also, I mean, you grew up middle class, right, in a, in a, a suburb of Seattle. Like, I think this is something a lot of us struggle with. How do you... Um, live a sort of um, um, uh, organic life of integrity when there's a lot of 
appropriation of the things that we think are the, are the right things by corporate interest. I mean, like Whole Foods is a great example. Not that there's anything particularly wrong with Whole Foods, but is that the, the local place? Is that where we're supposed to be going? Is that something you struggle with? Well, it's close to my house, and... <laughs> <laughs> And you're hungry. So, but these are the kinds of minute, I think it is, there is a certain privilege in, ha in these minute battles. You know, I think of uh, that Alexander Pope um, poem, Rape of the Lock, and it's a mock epic. And I think of us in Portland and in communities like Portland, we're engaging in these mock epics, these battles, these tiny battles. You know, it's like, what's better for me to walk to Whole Foods, which is based in Austin and a big corporation, or drive my mean car to New Seasons, which is local. It's like, but it's also like, who cares? Is that the biggest battle I'm having today? You know, I, I can put food on my table and, you know, I mean, so I think that there's this awareness that we all have that these kinds of arguments in our head are, come from a place where we're lucky enough to worry about those the things. The show, to a certain extent, is a critique of liberal, yeah, middle and, class, and, yeah, and a predominantly white privilege. Yeah, and but you know, it's at the same time, you know, we're it's it's about you know feeling lucky, but also wondering like, is this really the way that that we should be living? But um, I love Portland. I should say that. <laughs> <laughs> I know it. it um, uh, even though you'd never heard of it when you were a kid, uh, I, I I know there's. It generalizes to a certain extent, like mid-sized cities, fine. Mm -hmm. But when you started this series, did you, did you worry at all that, that this was too inside, that people and then the rest of the world wouldn't get it if you're, you're doing jokes about Portland? Well, I think that was definitely the question the first season, and that was answered um, very quickly, that it, it wasn't uh, specific to Portland, that in some ways we're talking about a mindset, we're talking about a lifestyle, and we have people that watch our show, it's on in 86 countries, and people relate to it in Melbourne, Australia, and in you know New York, Madison, Wisconsin. I've had people, I've been in the Salt Lake City airport, and had people say that they live 40 minutes outside Salt Lake in a rural area, and that they love watching the show. So I think that it, it is relatable in the same way that in order to watch The Wire, we don't necessarily have to have lived that life. Um, <laughs> and. I've never Although your description of Portland sounded yeah. very similar. So. Yes, it's very similar. And, you know, I've never been to space, but I can relate, you know, I still understand a show that takes place in space. <laughs> so I, I always, I, that question to me is always a little funny because I'm like, well, of course, we always are engaged in art that, that takes us outside of our experience. You, um, I mean, before you became known for Portlandia, you were, of course, a musician and rocker. You were in Slater Kinney, uh, uh, more, more recently Wild Flag. A lot of us are big fans. How did you end up making this link, this leap from punk to comedy, from music to comedy? Uh, was, it, was it as big a shift as those of us on the outside see, or did it feel very organic to you? It felt organic. I think, as a kid, I was always engaged in performance and wanting to forge connections that kind of tuned out like the static of just you know, regular discourse that had some kind of moment that sort of just cut through the din, I guess. And music was very much like that for me. Uh, it was spontaneous and it was about, you know, emotion and kind of expressing things that were harder for me uh, just in day to day. And I think comedy is the same way. You know, it's just carving out meaning from, you know, a broader mm. situation. And I think that's what music is too, in the best sense. You know, a song is distilling a moment or distilling a sentiment. And, and hopefully our show does that every once in a while. So to me, it's all part of that, that connection. When you, is it when you write music or you play music that it's that carving out meaning that you talk about? I think both. I mean, certainly in the process of writing a song and writing lyrics, it's like that. And certainly in the live experience, you know, it's, it's definitely about communicating with people in a way that, you know, is just more and more difficult, I think, um, because it's, it's more about emotion and, and less about just kind of that static and all the misinterpretation that goes on. Is it weird, is it strange for you that increasingly people, are, and even fans of yours, might be huge fans of what you do and not know about your musical past? Like not even know you're a guitarist or, or that you played in these bands? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's fine. <laughs> it's weird, it's weird, but it's okay. You know, um, it's, it's interesting to surprise people, I guess. But yeah, I'm worried now that if I play guitar, people think I'm doing it ironically, which... <laughs> <laughs> She's pretty good for a comedian. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's one of my worst fears. So I, 
yeah, I have to work on my guitar face so it looks really earnest. <laughs> I, 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 was, uh, I was just talking to the Portia Sabin out here, the, the president of Kill Rock Stars. You know that label, of course. Um, she was talking about comedy being the new punk rock. Do you agree? Well, I mean, I think that there's certainly been a, a commonality between punk and comedy for years. You know, it's people that have felt like outsiders that I think are channeling like, anger and angst and are finding ways of giving themselves license to kind of address some of this pain. And I think there is something that's very dangerous about comedy right now, especially stand-up. You know, I think that, not so much television comedy, but when you see stand-up sometimes, there is something so bare about that and so raw. And I, you don't always see that in music anymore. Um, and I think that's okay. I mean, music, I think, embodies a lot more mystery and persona, and some of it is very stripped bare. But comedy, there's just really nothing protecting you. And I think a lot of early punks felt like that, mm -hmm. that you know th they were met with so much disagreement and so much misunderstanding that really they had to push themselves so hard. And I see a lot of comics doing that, and it, it does feel punk, but I don't, I don't know if it's replaced punk, but it, it certainly feels vibrant. Do you feel like it's harder to speak out? I, I mean, the, the orthodoxy is to sort of say music is less uh, political because it's become more manufactured or all of that stuff and yet it's also become more democratic there's more bands out there's more artists you can reach people through the internet and all that but we do live in this culture of outrage online and, and, and in a world where you know you say the wrong thing you're gonna be attacked do you, is that what happened to political music I mean where where are where if, if it's Wait, I thought Porsche was the expert how did I get well to because you've been talking about it I'm <laughs> okay. curious and because yeah. you're uniquely positioned I mean to a certain extent with one foot in both camps what's your perspective on that what was the question I'm not sure <laughs> I think the question was, why, why do you think political protest music has ebbed? Well, I mean, I think for one, we live in a very atomized society. So, you know, you can kind of find your niche battles and uh, it's hard to kind of cohere around a singular moment for too long. Um, that moment, that wave quickly passes and something else comes along. And so I think, you know, it's, there, there, it's less monolithic and I think political music really thrives on sort of solidity and like things that forms like like something that feels mountainous you know and like the the internet is there's an ephemeral quality to it you know and so i think um i think music that kind of cuts through isn't necessarily political but i don't know i mean now i'm just rambling so <laughs> Well, you used the, the words atomized and mountainous in one answer, which I thought was... Okay, well, uh, <laughs> you know. But, you know, <laughs> yeah. energizing, if nothing else. Yeah. Um, this, I must ask you about, uh, we've got about a minute and a half. Portland has, uh, Portlandia has already been renewed for a fifth season. You're, you're finishing a memoir. Mm -hmm. Now, you're in a band, you do this show with Fred. Oh, uh, what's it like writing on your own? I mean, uh, um, with, with so much of your work being collaborative, how's this memoir been for you? Well, maybe one of the reasons that um, the internet is not political is because writers spend most of their time procrastinating <laughs> on it, and, and as do, it does everyone else. I've never, I've found so many ways of procrastinating. I ordered a New Kids on the Block t-shirt off eBay, <laughs> and, um, and in my mind, like, justified it. I was like, this is not ironic. I actually saw them. <laughs> this is, I can, I can wear this earnestly, but um, it's, it's definitely the, one of the most difficult things I've done. It, it feels like just banging your head against the wall, and sometimes the result is pain, and sometimes the result is illuminating. And when you hit your head and it hurts, but it's illuminating, then that's a good sentence. <laughs> it's been illuminating having you here. Not painful. Thank you so much for this, Carrie. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. Carrie Thanks, Brownstein.